Oops. Some wacky ant knit that okay. for you. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the final session of coffee, tea, and Charlie. <laughs> Mask Hello, everyone. Now, Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. So this has been a, a, a long journey. Can you hear me? No. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I'm getting a weird feedback. I'm going to turn you up. Hold on. What did he say? He's going to turn you up. Oh. <laughs> there's, a, there's a Beatles song there somewhere. <laughs> Right, how's that? Is that better? It's okay. okay. All right. So, um, yes, welcome to the last session. It's been quite a journey. And interestingly enough, we're ending, I think, kind of around the time that he ended his trip. So that's interesting. Um, so I timed this out. There's 22 pages left. And if I read them all, it'll take a little bit too long. And I want to have discussion too. So there's a couple of parts that I'll summarize, um, but I definitely want to, you know, read the end pages. Um, also, this part of the book <clears throat> has some language that is um, uh, serious. So I will not say the words. Uh, let's see here. I think I will say the word Nancy instead. <laughs> Uh, instead of saying the word that these Southern people are saying, I will say Nancy. But that said, I'm going to have to skip around a little bit. But uh, he is in Texas. He is heading for New Orleans. And I will start from there. So he has just visited his wife's family in Texas. He says, well, I was still in Texas late in 1960. The incident most reported and pictured in the newspapers was the matriculation of a couple of tiny Negro children in a New Orleans school. Behind these small dark mites, there were the law's majesty and the law's power to enforce. Both the scales and the sword were allied with the infants, while against them were 300 years of fear and anger and terror of change in a changing world. I had seen photographs in the papers every day motion pictures on the television screen. Now, do any of you remember this? Yes, yes. Oh, yes. yes. Absolutely. The cheerleaders is what they were called, yeah. What made the newsmen love the story was a group of stout middle-aged women who by some curious definition of the word mother gathered every day to scream invectives at children. Further, a small group of them had become so expert that they were known as the cheerleaders and a crowd gathered every day to enjoy and to applaud their performance. This strange drama seemed so improbable that I felt I had to see it. It had the same draw as a five-legged calf or a two-headed fetus at a sideshow, a distortion of normal life we have always found so interesting that we will pay to see it perhaps to prove to ourselves that we have the proper number of legs or heads. In the New Orleans show, I felt all the amusement of the improbable abnormal, but also a kind of horror that it could be so. At this time, the winter, which had been following my track ever since I left home, suddenly struck with a black norther. It brought ice and freezing sleet and sheeted the highways with dark ice. I gathered Charlie from the good doctor. He looked half his age and felt wonderful. And to prove it, he ran and jumped and rolled and laughed and gave little yips of pure joy. It felt very good to have him with me again, sitting up right in the seat beside me, peering ahead at the unrolling road or curling up to sleep with his head in my lap and his silly ears available for fondling. That dog can sleep through any amount of judicious caresses. There's the dog. Yeah. Now we stopped dawdling and laid our wheels to the road and went. We could not go fast because of the ice, but we drove relentlessly, hardly glancing at the passing of Texas beside us. And Texas was achingly endless, Sweetwater and Ballinger and Austin. We bypassed Houston. We stopped for gasoline and coffee and slabs of pie. 
Charlie had his meals and his walks in gas stations. Night did not stop us, and when my eyes ached and burned from peering too long and my shoulders were side hills of pain, I pulled into a turnout and crawled like a mole into my bed, only to see the highway writhe along behind my closed lids. No more than two hours could I sleep and then out into the bitter cold night and on and on. Water beside the road was frozen solid and people moved about with shawls and sweaters wrapped around their ears. I think I am gonna, let's see here, hold on. Uh, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit because I have to skip some paragraphs here. Um, hmm. So he's going by Lake Charles, Louisiana, different things. And then I'm going to go to, to uh, hmm. I'm going to go to 184. So anyway, there's a guy in a gas station and he makes a comment that about Charlie and they get into a little bit of a thing. And now Steinbeck is realizing that he's heading towards the south and that he's gonna be in a very different place than he's been in the rest of the time. He says, I had camouflaged myself in an old blue jacket and my British Navy cap on the supposition that in a seaport, no one ever looks at a sailor any more than a waiter is inspected in a restaurant. So he wants to be inconspicuous in New Orleans among this crowd of people and not to draw attention to himself. In his natural haunts, a sailor has no face and certainly no plans beyond getting drunk and maybe in jail for fighting. At least that's the general feeling about sailors. I've tested it. The most that happens is a kindly voice of authority saying, why don't you go back to your ship, sailor? You wouldn't want to sit in the tank and miss your tide now, would you, sailor? And the speaker wouldn't recognize you five minutes later. And the lion and unicorn on my cap made me even more anonymous, but I must warn anyone testing my theory, never try it away from a shipping port. Where are you from? The driver asked with a complete lack of interest. So now he's taking a taxi to go see the cheerleader people. Liverpool, limey, huh? Well, you'll be all right. It's the goddamn New York Jews that cause all the trouble. I found my, oh, I'm gonna give you a little uh, history lesson about limeys. So American sailors called British sailors limeys because the British sailors used to put lime in their rum and cokes, but they did that to prevent scurvy. Yeah. I found myself with a British inflection and by no means one of Liverpool. Jews, what? How do they cause trouble? Why hell, mister, we know how to take care of this. Everybody's happy and getting along fine. Why I like Nancy's and then damn New York Jews come in and stir the Nancy's up. They just stay in New York. There wouldn't be no trouble. Ought to take them out. You mean lynch them? I don't mean nothing else, mister. He let me out and I started to walk away. Don't try to get too close, mister. He called after me. Just you enjoy it, but don't mix in. Thanks, I said, and killed the awfully that came to my tongue. As I walked toward the school, I was in a stream of people, all white and all going in my direction. They walked intently like people going to a fire after it has been burning for some time. They beat their hands against their hips or hugged them under coats and many men had scarves under their hats and covering their ears. Across the street from the school, the police had set up wooden barriers to keep the crowd back and they paraded back and forth, ignoring the jokes called to them. The front of the school was deserted, but along the curb, United States Marshals were spaced, not in uniform, but wearing armbands to identify them. Their guns bulged decently under their coats, but their eyes darted about nervously, inspecting faces. It seemed to me that they inspected me to see if I was a regular and then abandoned me as unimportant. It was apparent where the cheerleaders were because people shoved forward to try to get near them. They had a favored place at the barricade directly across from the school entrance. And in that area, a concentration of police stamped their feet and slapped their hands together in unaccustomed gloves. 
Suddenly I was pushed violently and a cry went up. Here she comes, let her through. Come on, move back, let her through. Where you been? You're late for school. Where you been, Nellie? The name was not Nellie. I forget what it was. But she shoved through the dense crowd quite near enough to me so that I could see her coat of imitation fleece and her gold earrings. She was not tall, but her body was ample and full busted. I judge she was about 50. She was heavily powdered, which made the line of her double chin look very dark. She wore a ferocious smile and pushed her way through the milling people, holding a fistful of clippings high in her hand to keep them from being crushed. Since it was her left hand, I looked particularly for a wedding ring and saw there was none. I slipped in behind her to get carried along by her wave, but the crush was dense and I was given a warning too. Watch it, sailor. Everybody wants to hear. <laughs> Nellie was received with shouts of greeting. I don't know how many cheerleaders there were. There was no fixed line between the cheerleaders and the crowd behind them. What I could see was that a group was passing newspaper clippings back and forth and reading them aloud with little squeals of delight. Now the crowd grew restless as an audience does when the clock goes past curtain time. Men all around me looked at their watches. I looked at mine. It was three minutes to nine. The show opened on time, sound of sirens, motorcycle cops, then two big black cars filled with big men in blonde felt hats pulled up in front of the school. The crowd seemed to hold its breath. Four big marshals got out of each car and from somewhere in the automobiles, they extracted the littlest Negro girl you ever saw, dressed in shining starchy white with new white shoes on feet so little they were almost round. Her face and little legs were very black against the white. The big marshals stood her on the curb and a jangle of jeering shrieks went up from behind the barricades. The little girl did not look at the howling crowd, but from the side, the whites of her eyes showed like those of a frightened fawn. The men turned her around like a doll and then the strange procession moved up the broad walk toward the school and the child was even more a mite because the men were so big. Then the girl made a curious hop, and I think I know what it was. I think in her whole life, she had not gone 10 steps without skipping. But now in the middle of her first skip, the weight bore her down, and her little round feet took measured, re reluctant steps toward the tall guards. Slowly they climbed the steps and entered the school. The papers had printed that the jibes and jeers were cruel and something obscene, and so they were. But this was not the big show. The crowd was waiting for the white man who dared to bring his white child to school. And here he came along the guarded walk, a tall man dressed in light gray, leading his frightened child by the hand. His body was tensed as a strong leaf spring drawn to the breaking strain. His face was grave and gray, and his eyes were on the ground immediately ahead of him. The muscles of his cheeks stood out from clenched jaws, a man afraid who by his will had held his fears in check as a great rider directs a panicked horse. A shrill grating voice rang out. The yelling was not in chorus. Each took a turn and at the end of each, the crowd broke into howls and roars and whistles of applause. This is what they had come to see and hear. No newspaper had printed the words these women shouted. It was indicated that they were indelicate. Some even said obscene. On television, the soundtrack was made to blur or had crowd noises cut into cover. But now I heard the words, bestial and filthy and degenerate. In a long and unprotected life, I have seen and heard the vomitings of demoniac humans before. Why then did these screams fill me with a shocked and sickened sorrow? The words written down are dirty, carefully and selectively filthy. 
but there was something far worse here than dirt, a kind of frightening witch's Sabbath. Here was no spontaneous cry of anger or of insane rage. Perhaps that is what made me sick with weary nausea. Here was no principle, good or bad, no direction. These blousy women with their little hats and their clippings hungered for attention. They wanted to be admired. They simpered in happy, almost innocent triumph when they were applauded. There was the demented cruelty of egocentric children, and somehow this made their insensate beastliness much more heartbreaking. These were not mothers, not even women. They were crazy actors playing to a crazy audience. The crowd behind the barrier roared and cheered and pounded one another with joy. The nervous strolling police watched for any break over the barrier. Their lips were tight, but a few of them smiled and quickly unsmiled. Across the street, the US marshals stood unmoving. The gray clothed man's legs had speeded for a second, but he reined them down with his will and walked up the school pavement. The crowd quieted and the next cheer lady had her turn. Her voice was the bellow of a bull, a deep and powerful shout with flat edges like a circus barker's voice. There is no need to set down her words. The pattern was the same. Only the rhythm and tonal quality were different. Anyone who had been near the theater would know that these speeches were not spontaneous. They were tried and memorized and carefully rehearsed. This was theater. I watched the intent faces of the listening crowd and they were the faces of an audience. When there was applause, it was for a performer. My body churned with weary nausea, but I could not let an illness blind me after I had come so far to look and to hear. And suddenly I knew something was wrong and distorted and out of drawing. I knew New Orleans. I have over the years had many friends there, thoughtful, gentle people with a tradition of kindness and courtesy. I remembered Lyle Saxon, a huge man of soft laughter. How many days I have spent with Rourke Bradford, who took Louisiana sounds and sights and created God and the green pastures to which he leadeth us. I looked in the crowd for such faces of such people and they were not there. I've seen this kind bellow for blood at a prize fight, have orgasms when a man is gored in the bull ring, stare with vicious, vicarious lust at a highway accident, stand patiently in line for the privilege of watching any pain or any agony. But where were the others, the ones who would be proud they were of a species with the gray man, the ones whose arms would ache to gather up the small scared black might? I don't know where they were. Perhaps they felt as helpless as I did, but they left New Orleans misrepresented to the world. The crowd, no doubt, rushed home to see themselves on television. And what they saw went out all over the world, unchallenged by the other things that I know are there. And that's a really interesting statement. And a lot of my college students always write uh, on that little segment there that so many places let a small group of people represent their whole place to the world. And then that place becomes that place in people's minds. And it's such a small subsection of people. But where are the other people? Like Steinbeck saying, you know, he knows all these good people in New Orleans, but they're not there. But all these other people are. And that's what is being broadcast out to the world. So he says, the show was over and the river of us began to move away. The second show would be when school bell closing, school closing bell rang and the little black face had to look out at her accusers once again. I was in New Orleans of the great restaurants. I know them all and most of them know me. And I could, no, I could no more have gone to Galatoire's for an omelet and a champagne. 
that I could than I could have danced on a grave. Even setting this down on paper has raised the weary, hopeless nausea in me again. It is not written to amuse. It does not amuse me. I bought a poor boy's sandwich and got out of town. Not too far along, I found a pleasant resting place where I could sit and munch and contemplate and stare out over the stately brown, slow moving father of waters, the Mississippi, as my spirit required. Charlie did not wander about, but sat close and pressed his shoulder against my knee. And he does that only when I am ill. So I suppose I was ill with a kind of sorrow. I lost track of time, but a while after the sun had passed top, a man came walking and we exchanged good afternoons. He was a neatly dressed man, well along in years with a Greco face and fine wind lifted white hair and a clipped white mustache. I asked him to join me and when he accepted, I went into my house and set coffee to cooking. And remembering how Rourke Radford liked it, I doubled the dosage, two heaping tablespoons of coffee to each cup and two heaping for the pot. I cracked an egg and cupped out the yolk and dropped white and shells into the pot for I know nothing that polishes coffee and makes it shine like that. The air was still very cold and a cold night was coming so that the brew rising from cold water to a rolling boil gave the good smell that competes successfully with other good smells. My guest was satisfied and he warmed his hands against the plastic cup. By your license, you're a stranger here, he said. How do you come to know about coffee? I learned on Bourbon Street from giants in the earth, I said. <laughs> but they would have asked the bean of a darker roast and they would have liked a little chicory for bite. You do know, he said, you're not a stranger after all. And can you make Diablo? For parties, yes. You come from here? More generations than I can prove beyond doubt except classified under Sigit in St. Louis. I see you're of that breed. I'm glad you stopped by. I used to know St. Louis, even collected epitaphs. Did you, sir? You'll remember the queer one then. If it's the same one, I tried to memorize it. You mean that one that starts to last the one who's darned thief joy? That's it, Robert John Creswell died 1845, aged 26. I wish I could remember it. Have you a paper? You can write it down. And when I had a pad on my knee, he said, alas, that one whose darnfully joy had often to trust in heaven, should canty thus sudden to from all its hopes benevens and through thy love for off remore that dealt the dog pest thou left to prove thy sufferings while below. I have no idea what they're talking about right now. <laughs> So anyway, then, then I'm going to start talking about the cheerleaders. I guess it's Lewis Carroll wrote that. He says, um, uh, everyone does. He says, are you traveling for pleasure? I was until today. I saw the cheerleaders. Oh, yes, I see, he said. And a weight and a darkness fell on him. What's going to happen? I don't know. I just don't know. I don't dare think about it. Why do I have to think about it? I'm too old. Let the others take care of it. Can you see an end? Oh, certainly an end. It's the means, it's the means, but you're from the North, this isn't your problem. I guess it's everybody's problem. It isn't local. Would you have another cup of coffee and talk to me about it? I don't have a position. I mean, I want to hear. There's nothing to learn, he said. It seems to change its face with who you are and where you've been and how you feel, not think, but feel. You didn't like what you saw, would you? Maybe less than you because I know all of its aching past and some of its stinking future. That's an ugly word, sir, but there's no other. Well, the Negroes want to be people. Are you against that? Bless you, no, sir. But to get to be people, they must fight those who aren't satisfied to be people. You mean the Negroes won't be satisfied with any gain? 
Are you? Is anyone that you know? Would you be content to let them be people? Content enough, but I wouldn't understand it. I've got too many sajits here. How can I tell you? Well, suppose your dog here. He looks a very intelligent dog. He is. Well, suppose he could talk and stand on his hind legs. Maybe he could do very well in every way. Perhaps you could invite him to dinner. But could you think of him as people? Do you mean, how would I like my sister to marry him? He laughed. I'm only telling you how hard it is to change a feeling about things. And will you believe that it will be just as hard for Negroes to change their feeling about us as it is for us to change about them? This isn't new. It's been going on a long time. Anyway, the subject skims the joy off a pan of conversation. That it does, sir. I'm what you might call an enlightened Southerner mistaking an insult for a compliment. As such a newborn hybrid, I know what will happen over the ages. It's starting now in Africa and in Asia. You mean absorption? If they outnumber us, we will disappear, or more likely both will disappear into something new. And meanwhile? It's the meanwhile frightens me, sir. The ancients placed love and war in the hands of closely related gods. That was no accident. That, sir, was a profound knowledge of man. You reason well. The ones you saw today do not reason at all. They're the ones who may alert the god. Then, then you do think it can't happen in peace. I don't know, he cried. I guess that's the worst. I just don't know. I wish you would ride along with me. Are you on the move? No, I have a little place just off there below that grove. I spend a lot of time there, mostly reading old things, mostly looking at old things. It's my intentional method of avoiding the issue because I'm afraid of it. I guess we all do some of that. He smiled. I have an old Negro couple as old as I am to take care of me. And sometimes in the evening, we forget. They forget to envy me and I forget they might. And we are just three pleasant things living together and smelling the flowers. Things, I repeated. That's interesting. Not man and beast, not black and white, but pleasant things. My wife told me of an old man who said, I remember a time when Negroes had no souls. It was much better and easier then. Now it's confusing. I don't remember, but it must be so. It is my guess that we can cut and divide our inherited guilt like a birthday cake, he said. And save for the mustache, he looked like the Greco San Pablo who holds the closed book in his hands. Surely my ancestors had slaves, he said, but it is possible that yours caught them and sold them to us. I have a Puritan strain that might well have done so. If by force you make a creature live and work like a beast, you must think of him as a beast, else empathy would drive you mad. And once you have classified him in your mind, your feelings are safe. He stared at the river and the breeze stirred his hair like white smoke. And if your heart has human vestiges of courage and anger, which in a man are virtues, then you have fear of a dangerous beast. And since your heart has intelligence and inventiveness and the ability to conceal them, you live with terror. Then you must crush his manlike tendencies and make of him the docile beast you want. And if you can teach your child from the beginning about the beast, he will not share your bewilderness. I've been told the good old time Negro sang and danced and was content. He also ran away. The fugitive laws suggest how often. You're not what the North thinks of as a Southerner. Perhaps not, but I'm not alone. He stood up and dusted his trousers with his fingers. No, not alone. I'll go along to my pleasant things now. I have not asked your name, sir, nor offered mine. Sijit, he said, Monsieur Sijit, a big family, a common name. When he went away, I felt a sweetness like music, if music could pleasure the skin with a little chill. To me, it had been a day larger than a day, 
not to be measured against other days with any chance of matching. With little sleep the night before, I knew I should stop. I was very tired, but sometimes fatigue can be a stimulant and a compulsion. It forced me to fill my gas tank and compelled me to stop and offer a ride to an old Negro who trudged with heavy heels in the grass grown verge beside the concrete road. He was reluctant to accept and did so only as though helpless to resist. He wore the battered clothes of a field hand and an ancient broadcloth coat highly polished by age and wear. His face was coffee colored and cross hatched with a million tiny wrinkles and his lower lids showed red rims like a bloodhound's eyes. He clasped his hands in his lap, knotted and lumpy as cherry twigs, and all of him seemed to shrink in the seat as though he sucked in his outline to make it smaller. That is one hell of a description. Mm -hmm. He never looked at me. I could not see that he looked at anything. But first he asked, dog bite, Captain, sir? No, he's friendly. After a long, silent while, I asked, how are things going with you? Fine, just fine, Captain, sir. How do you feel about what's going on? He didn't answer. I mean about the schools and the sit-ins. I don't know nothing about that, Captain, sir. You work on a farm? Crop a cotton lot, sir. Make a living at it? I get along fine, Captain, sir. We went in silence for a stretch upriver. The trees and the tropic grass were burned and sad from the ferocious northern freeze. After a time, I said more to myself than to him. After all, why should you trust me? A question is a trap and an answer is your foot in it. I remembered a scene, something that had happened in New York and was moved to tell him about it, but I quickly abandoned the impulse because out of the corner of my eye, I could see that he had drawn away and squeezed himself against the far side of the cab, but the memory was strong. Hmm. All right, uh, I gotta skip ahead a little bit. Um, Right, I'm going to skip ahead to, hmm. well, so I'll just let you know. So he has, um, Hey Jake. Yeah. Would it, would it be helpful to have another week? Cause we could do one more week if we're running out of uh, time. I'm just saying, I, I don't think anyone would mind. If you have. Not at all. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, that's fine. Cause I, cause there is besides the end, there's also, um, a kind of review of the book that's really good. So um, yeah, yeah. So let me let me read the rest of this then. Yeah, let's slow down and savor. And we we do. I just wanted to mention. I did mention this at the beginning, but we have a ten thirty program, so it'd be good for us to finish right on time if we can today. So okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. But the memory was strong. I lived then in a small brick house in Manhattan. So he's having a little memory about something that happened to him long ago. And being for the moment solvent, I employed a Negro. Across the street and on the corner, there was a bar and restaurant. One winter dusk when the sidewalks were iced, I stood in my window looking out and saw a tipsy woman come out of the bar, slip on the ice and fall flat. She tried to struggle up, but slipped and fell again and lay there screaming maudlinly. At the moment, the Negro who worked for me came around the corner, saw the woman and instantly crossed the street, keeping as far from her as possible. When he came in, I said, I saw you duck. Why didn't you give that woman a hand? Well, sir, she's drunk and I'm a Negro. If I touched her, she could easily scream rape. And then it's a crowd and who believes me? It took quick thinking to duck that fast. Oh no, sir, he said. I've been practicing to be a Negro for a long time. And now in Rosinante, I was foolishly trying to destroy a lifetime of practice. I won't ask you any more questions, I said, but he squirmed with restlessness. Would you let me down here, please, Captain? I live nearby. 
I let him down and saw in the mirror how he took up his trudging beside the road. He didn't live nearby at all, but walking was safer than riding with me. Weariness flagged me down and I stopped in a pleasant motel. The beds were good, but I could not sleep. The gray man walked across my eyes in the faces of the cheerleaders, but mostly I saw the old man squeezed as far away from me as he could get, as though I carried the infection, and perhaps I did. I came out to learn, but what was I learning? I had not felt one moment free from the tension, a weight of savage fear. No doubt I felt it more being new come, but it was there. I hadn't brought it. Everyone, white and black, lived in it and breathed it. All ages, all trades, all classes. To them, it was a fact of existence and it was building pressure like a boil. Could there be no relief until it burst? I had seen so little of the whole I didn't see a great deal of World War II, one landing out of a hundred, a few separated times of combat, a few thousand dead out of millions, but I saw enough and felt enough to believe war was no stranger. So here, a little episode, a few people, but the breath of fear was everywhere. I wanted to get away a cowardly attitude perhaps, but more cowardly to deny. But the people around me lived here. They accepted it as a permanent way of life. Had never known it otherwise, nor expected it to stop. The Cockney children in London were restless when the bombing stopped and disturbed a pattern to which they had grown accustomed. So he's talking about their conditioning, that the people who live down here have been conditioned um, to think of each other in certain ways, to be a certain way, just to be able to exist, just as if people who got used to bombings, when the bombings aren't there, they expect them to be there and it disturbs them that they're not. I tossed about until Charlie grew angry with me and told me several times, but Charlie doesn't have our problems. He doesn't belong to a species clever enough to split the atom, but not clever enough to live in peace with itself. I want to read that again, because that's pretty good. But Charlie doesn't have our problems. He doesn't belong to a species clever enough to split the atom, but not clever enough to live in peace with itself. He doesn't even know about race, nor is he concerned with his sister's marriage. It's quite the opposite. Once mm -hmm. Charlie fell in love with a dachshund, a romance racially unsuitable, physically <laughs> ridiculous, and mechanically impossible. Yeah. But all these problems, Charlie ignored. He loved deeply and tried dogfully. It would be difficult to explain to a dog the good and moral purpose of a thousand humans gathered to curse one tiny human. I've seen a look in dog's eyes, a quickly vanishing look of amazed contempt. And I am convinced that basically dogs think humans are nuts. I didn't choose my first customer the next day. He picked me. He sat on a stool next to me eating a hamburger whose twin I held in my hand. He was somewhere between 30 and 35, long and stringy and nice looking. His long lank hair was nearly ash blonde, worn long and treasured since he whooped it with a pocket comb unconsciously and often. He wore a light gray suit that was travel wrinkled and stained. He carried the jacket over his shoulder. His white shirt was open at the collar, permitted so by pulling down the knot of his pale paisley tie. His speech was the deepest South I had heard so far. He asked where I was going, and when I told him I aimed toward Jackson and Montgomery, begged to ride with me. When he saw Charlie, he thought at first I had a Nancy in there. It had got to be a pattern. We settled ourselves comfortably. He combed back his hair and complimented me on Rosinante. Of course, he said, I could tell right off that you're from the North. You've got a good ear, I said, I thought facetiously. Oh, I get around, he admitted. I think I was responsible for what happened. 
if I could have kept my mouth shut, I might have learned something of value. There's the restless night to blame and the length of the journey and the nervousness. Then too, Christmas was coming and I found myself thinking of getting home more often than was helpful. We established that I was traveling for pleasure and that he was on the lookout for a job. You come up the river, he said. Did you see the doings in New Orleans? Yes, I did. Wasn't they something, especially that Nellie. She really ripped the roof off. Yes, she did. Does your heart good to see somebody do their duty? I think it was there that I went haywire. <laughs> I should have grunted and let him read what he wanted in it, but a nasty little worm of anger began to stir in me. They doing it out of duty? I think it was there. Oh, sure. God bless them. Somebody got to keep the Nancys out of our schools. The sublimity of self-sacrifice activating the cheerleaders overwhelmed him. Comes a time when a man's got to sit down and think. And that's the time got to make up your mind to sell your life for something you believe in. Did you decide to do it? I sure did, and a lot more like me. What do you believe in? I'm not just about to allow my kids to go to school with no Nancys. Yes, sir, I'll sell my life first, but I aim to kill me a whole flock of Nancys before I go. How many children do you have? He swung around toward me. I don't have any, but I aim to have some, and I promise you they won't go to school with no Nancys. Do you propose to sell your life before or after you have children? I had to watch the road, so I only got a glimpse of his expression, and it wasn't pleasant. You sound to me like a Nancy lover. I might have known it. Troublemakers come down here and tell us how to live. Well, you won't get away with it, mister. We got an eye on you, commie Nancy lovers. I just had a brave picture of you selling your life. By God, I was right. You are a Nancy lover. No, I'm not. And I'm not a white lover either, if it includes those noble cheerladies. His face was near to me. You want to hear what I think of you? No, I heard Nellie use the words yesterday. I put on the brake and pulled Rosinante off the road. He looked puzzled. What are you stopping for? Get out, I said. Oh, you want to go around? No, I want you to get out. You gonna make me? I reached into the space between the seat and the door where there is nothing. Okay, okay, he said, and got out and slammed the door so hard that Charlie wailed with annoyance. I started instantly, but I heard him scream, and in the mirror saw his hating face and his open spit-ringed mouth. He shrilled, Nancy lover, Nancy lover, as long as I could see him, and I don't know how long after. It's true, I goaded him, but I couldn't help it. I guess when they're drafting peacemakers, they'd better pass me by. I picked up one more passenger between Jackson and Montgomery, a young black student with a sharp face and the look and feel of impatient fierceness. He carried three fountain pens in his breast pocket and his inner pocket bulged with papers. I knew he was a student because I asked him. He was alert, license plate and speech relaxed him as much as he is ever likely to relax. We discussed the sit-ins. He had taken part in them and in the bus boycott. I told him what I had seen in New Orleans. He had been there. He had expected what I was shocked at. Finally, we spoke of Martin Luther King Jr. and his teaching of passive but unrelenting resistance. It's too slow, he said. It will take too long. There's improvement. There's constant improvement. Gandhi proved it's the only weapon that can win against violence. I know all that. I've studied it. The gains are drops of water and time is passing. I want it faster. I want action. Action now. That might defeat the whole thing. I might be an old man before I'm a man at all. I might be dead before. That's true. And Gandhi's dead. And there are many like you who want action. Yes, I mean some. I mean, I don't know how many. We talked of many things then. He was a passionate and articulate young man with anxiety and fierceness just below the surface. 
But when I dropped him in Montgomery, he leaned through the window of the cab and he laughed. I'm ashamed, he said. It's just selfishness, but I want to see it. Me, not dead. Here, me. I want to see it. Soon. And then he swung around and wiped his eyes with his hand and he walked quickly away. With all the polls and opinion posts with newspapers more opinion than news so that we no longer know one from the other, I want to be very clear about one thing. I have not intended to present, nor do I think I have presented any kind of cross section so that a reader can say, quote, he thinks he has presented a true picture of the South. I don't. I've only told what a few people said to me and what I saw. I don't know whether they were typical or whether any conclusion can be drawn, but I do know it is a troubled place and a people caught in a jam. And I know that the solution when it arrives will not be easy or simple. I feel with Monsieur Sijit that the end is not in question. It's the means the dreadful uncertainty of the means. That's a, it's a very powerful um, part of the book. And uh, I'm gonna leave uh, the next section in the appendix um, for next week so we can talk about, you know, kind of our reflections on the book, but um, did any of you go to the South during the early 60s at all? Or did you spend any time in the South during the civil rights movement or have any firsthand experience of that? I actually, in Florida, at a, at a residence there called Westminster Winter Park that I used to do similar work in teaching classes and stuff. One of the women there actually um, was at the church um, where the bomb went off. Um, because she was a civil rights worker um, and had spent a couple years down there doing work and had written about it. It was very powerful, um, the things she had witnessed down there. So I'm just wondering if any of you went down south at all or were living down south during that time? No. I was a student at the University of Wisconsin then and I got to hear Martin Luther King speak Mm. Um, as a Northern Midwesterner, uh, his speech was something I'd never heard before. It was a kind of um, embellished flowery language that felt completely new to me, uh, the language of a, a Southern preacher. Um, but I feel very fortunate that I did see him and hear him. Did he come to Madison? He came to Madison and um, spoke to the students there. Uh, the place was absolutely packed. There was standing room only and people waiting outside. Mm. Um, yeah. Tuskegee Institute. Linda spent a semester at Tuskegee Institute teaching student teaching when she was uh, at Iowa State. And uh, I guess you're one of the few white people on that campus, but to, you know, had socialized and all that, had a experience of being in her dorm room before the, her um, roommate arrived, who was a black woman, young black girl. And, and uh, she was rather surprised to see Lynn there. <laughs> <laughs> And how, how long was she there for? Was there, what, three or four months? Three or four It was a sem months. Yeah, semester oh. doing student teaching. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Oh, we have a hand up. Well, here, here we are talking, talking about the Big Ten schools. And I was at Iowa in the late 50s and celebrating my 21st birthday cabin outside of Iowa City, and uh, one of my friends uh, was dating somebody who had just come back from the Korean War, and I had invited two of my black basketball players, who 
friend to come to my party, and one of the vets walked up to me and said, we understand that your friend, your Nancy friends are coming, and we have someone out in the car with chains waiting for them. And I had to get a hold of my friends and say, I'm sorry, you cannot come because you're very dangerous. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems like it, it seems unimaginable. Um, and I think one of the things that affected Steinbeck um, so much, and I, I've read a lot of interviews with his wife um, about this book, because as I've told you, it was her favorite book that he wrote. And she said that so much of his humanity came out in this book in a way that in his longer novels, they didn't. But it definitely had a huge impact, um, a, a huge impact on him this part of the trip. Um, and it made him, as we'll see when we finish the book next week, it made him really just want to go right home. He had, he had planned other things along the South and the mid-Atlantic states. And as you'll see next week, he just kind of makes a beeline to get back to Long Island to be with his wife and to be in a world that makes somewhat of sense to him um, after, that, after that episode in New Orleans. So. Any other thoughts? No, I don't think so. yep. In 1944, my family moved from, went from the far north in Alaska directly to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. This was during the war, um, before, of course, long before civil rights. But we had a woman who came every week to help my mother. And um, she, would, she always was looking at the clock in the late afternoon. And I, always, and I asked my mother, and she said, well, she has to be home at a certain time and uh, before it gets dark. And I, my mother never said what it was about. I thought it had something to do with the war because that was really on the table. Mm -hmm. And I also knew that she sent home little, those little, what did we get in the war? Those little coupon things that you could get shoes and food. Ration. And food, rations. And so she, my mother would give her extra rations and, um, and send home food with her. But my mother never said why. So it was, of course, later years, of, and our northern mentality just didn't buy into that at all. Um, mm. but that was not during the civil rights time. That, but this mm. is how it goes back hundreds of years, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's that's one of the things that he says, you know, the, the monster seed jit, when he's talking this time back, he says, this is 300 years of conditioning and thinking and conditioning the kids to like not even think of them as being human so there's so much involved in it um that it would take an effort to decondition um to decondition that um yeah it's it's a, it's a really it's a tough part of the book because it's so unlike any other part of the book and then you get to this section that's about eight pages ten pages long and um, it, it always just sh shocks my college students to get to this part because, you know, they're reading this book and there's, you know, not there's some environmental stuff and pollution stuff and stuff about the future and chain stores and, and that's whatever. But this is pretty powerful. Um, but the, his description of the cheerleaders, what's this 50 years ago, reminds me of the performance art that's performed now on Twitter. Uh, people who are speaking out, saying things that are so uh, um, offensive, and have an audience for that. It, it sounds like something could happen today, mm. uh, maybe with some of the people who are in the House of Representatives who say things and and uh, are shocking people uh, with the cheerleader type uh, language and, and viewpoints. Mm. Go ahead, Mary. I, I was going to say that the the prejudice isn't only against black people. We ha we've had the experience in a small town, what, how many miles from a big university of walking into a restaurant um, with our Asian daughter-in-law and conversation completely stopping and everyone turning to stare at the door mm -hmm. to the point where um, she felt she had to have a very large husband by her side to go inside. 
and that that's recent. Um, so there is this this fear or <clears throat> distrust at, at anyone who's different. Yeah, it's interesting. I have a story <clears throat> in my book, Blue Collar Nomad, about um, when, I, when me and my friend Steve were out in Butte, Montana one time. And we were in our early 20s and he had like dyed white hair and a nose ring and I had long braids. Um, and we got surrounded at the gas station by this cadre of monster trucks. And they told us that we needed to get out of town. The, the name of the story is Get Out of Town Clowns because this little leader guy jumped down from his monster truck and walked right up to us and said, get out of town clowns. But then they all followed us in their trucks we were in a 1979 Ford Fairmont station wagon with a red velour interior, very nice. And uh, <laughs> they followed us out of town and they kept following us past all the Butte exits. And then once we passed the city limits of Butte, they, they turned back into where they lived. But I mean, we were the same skin yeah. tone and they still hated us just because we weren't, we didn't look like them and we weren't from there. So, I mean, local regionalism and, and Lo localness can be a good thing, but it can also be a, a bad thing. It pre prevents you from welcoming, you know, the stranger. And so one of the, this is the last thing I'll say, but one of the great things about pilgrim routes, if you ever walk a pilgrim route anywhere in the world, obviously the way of St. James is the big one um, that, that ends in Spain, but there's many pilgrim routes throughout the world. And one of the great thing about going on a pilgrimage is that everyone you know, there's a there's a, a thing about welcoming the other. And, and you can sit at, at a place with people from all over the world. And this is what Malcolm X changed Malcolm X's life. When Malcolm X went on his Hajj to Mecca, yeah, to Mecca. And you can read about it in his autobiography. He came back a totally changed human being and never had the same feelings about white people because he pilgrimaged with white people. And it totally changed his viewpoint on humanity. And that'll be the way I end today's class. But we'll finish up Travels with Charlie next week. And, uh, oh, yeah, well, have a, a Merry Christmas. Yeah. yeah. And we'll meet after that to finish the book. Good. Thank Great. you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care, Alan.